I'm also gonna look noisy because it's, I guess, not bright enough. I don't know. Mm. All right. Yeah, I refuse. Uh, hey man. Hey gang. Want to join us for some weird things? Question mark. We should be live on the stream. Hey, guess what, guys? What's up, buddy? Looks like they're probably adding Robin to Batman versus Superman. That's a thing that you just said. There's, there's more. See, but what you don't understand, Brian, is there's more people now. There's they more usually, people in the movie. That usually goes well, right? Like uh, whenever a superhero franchise moves into just like throwing everything against the wall. I mean, it worked out pretty well for Spider-Man 3. Worked out pretty well for Batman and Robin. Uh, worked out pretty well for... I just want to name... Oh, jeez. It's killing me. If you're going to name all of them, then you need to do the Mr. Plinkett list. <laughs> Batman and Robin. I have a theory. Spider-Man 3. What's that? What's up? I'm not, I'm not saying it's a very credible theory. I'm not saying I'd even put money behind this theory. But... Uh, uh, it would not surprise me if they were, cause you heard the, you heard the rumors about like, like, uh, the next Avengers might be two split into two. Oh shit. Yeah. No, I've not heard that, but, but that would be rad if it was. I have a feeling they may be doing Batman versus Superman as a split. Uh, and have it pay off like the next year, like, or you know, the, I haven't looked at the release calendar, but could do like a May December release, like they've done with some of the Potters or stuff or something. That would be a way to sort of make a big impact and dominate. You know, just like get it, boom. You know, look, it's out there. Well, now they're going up against. Uh, you know, Captain America Three isn't just Captain America Three. If if uh, they got Robert Downey Jr. War, in it, holy cow! Yeah. By by the way, uh, oh shoot, is that what they're doing? Is the Civil War storyline? That was what Variety reported. But I, I don't know how exactly credible that might be. <laughs> Let's back up for a moment. Variety, yes, the world's no, look. leading entertainment publication, has let loose a comic book rumor that the Civil War storyline may be the plot of the next major adventure. I mean, look, I, and, 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 and we're not the first podcast to mention it, but, like, geeks are the new jocks, man. Like, we won. We inherited the fucking planet, and here we are. And I'm sorry, I'm cursing now that we're live. Uh, but, but, like... Uh, that's a wonderful world to live in, as far as I'm concerned. And oh no, it's it's super rad. Uh, I'm I'm very excited about it, but I think it definitely puts that much more pressure on Batman versus Superman to actually be, you know, good. It's so weird too because DC, in the geek world of comic books, DC were the jocks. They were the ones that had the Superman movies. They were the ones who had all the popular. They had the Batman franchise. Nobody knew who uh, Iron Man was, and it's like I was busy reading all these flawed characters in the Marvel universe, and and everyone was just like, "Who you you don't like the right superheroes? It's Wonder right. Woman. You had the wrong friends. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, seriously, you need super friends or whatever. No, I'm <laughs> saying if you, you we're Marvel, we're Team Marvel what, here, I, and I always was, and and uh, yeah. Uh, Batman. Look, Batman. Uh, yeah. So I can make uh, a case against here's, Batman. Here's the crazy thing. So, you know, Guardians has now outgrossed domestically Man of Steel. It's huge, man. Uh, I think internationally, too. I think it's it. It's up above the Spider-Man and uh, and uh, Captain America internationally, which is like very, you know, like that's the mark of like you know, people in, in Bangladesh know who these characters are, and yet it's kind of caught on as an original franchise. And, and for all the studio people listening right now, yes, um, Guardians of the Galaxy didn't succeed because it was so heavily tied into the Marvel Universe. Oh, no. It yeah, it succeeded because it was just Marvel has this great team of people and lets people create great stuff. Well, and also it's like there's a there's – a, a, I mean, it succeeded because it was great storytelling. I, I'm not even going to say like the story is is the best story in the world. It's it's um, you know, it's it's find the magical widget before the other guy finds the magic. Yeah, widget, it's the right? same I mean, plot in every Marvel movie. Yes, exactly. But but it's like it found a way to um, Marvel, especially 
you know, uh, and Disney in general has a supreme knack for being able to figure out that middle room of what is the audience thinking? How can we make them okay with this? Yeah, and 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 they keep nailing that. They keep they keep hitting that hammer right on or that nail right on the head. Uh, I'll tell you what, though, the most I think the most intriguing rumor amongst all the Marvel stuff that came out was that uh, looking forward to what will be the gigantic payoff for a, a civil war thing is that you know the, the rumblings and we've heard kind of whispers of this that I found less than credible, and not to say that these are more credible, but rumblings that with Sony's Spider-Man franchise kind of uh, on the rocks that a way to reduce people's interest in Spider-Man is to loan him to Marvel for for a, a, you know an Avengers movie cameo or or subplot dude that's the problem is um and, and we could talk about this in picks but it's like uh, you know Penelope uh, had not seen any, not a single one of the Marvel uh, Universe movies. and um, You are a horrible father. Well, okay, but she saw Guardians of the Galaxy and loved it, and I was able to sell her on what she thought was a boys franchise, you know, with the Avengers, by, by, by saying that it was directly tied in and so on. And, and so, wait, what? I just want to interrupt for a second. We are in the age of geek. Imagine like, imagine like, yeah, my dad had to sell me on going to see Star Wars. Yeah. He's like, come on, Andy, come on. There's robots or like, no, dad, no, dad, I'm not, I don't get into the Star Wars. Thing. Well, and, and, but, but again, like, you know, yeah, whatever, like, like Penny is attracted it's, to it's the a beautiful funny. thing is what I'm saying. Like, yes. And, and, and understand the only reason I got her in the theater is uh, for Guardians was to tell her how funny it was. And it was funny, and it really made her happy. And there happened to be explosions and fighting and death and, you know, all, all these things. Um, but, uh, but, but from that, we've been able to bridge the gap where it's like, well, you realize that this is pretty much the other side of an Avengers story. And, uh, but before you see the Avengers, you got to watch it. Da, 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 da. And so, and, and finally, like yesterday, we got all the way caught up and she watched The Winter Soldier. And uh, Penelope, like, uh, for the first time ever, is like, I like stuff with big explosions. And I found myself saying, like, well, you might, you might like the X-Men. And she's like, I like uh, a lot of well-done fight choreography and explosions, Dad. And I was, I was like, the transformation is complete. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's the rumors that the, the next Avengers would be taken over by the, uh, the Winter Soldier directors, writer-directors. It's a great uh, watching it a second yeah, time. Yeah, the Russo brothers. Uh, I, I I did not expect the Winter Soldier to be as good as it was, and uh, in the theater, I thought I thought it was. I liked it, but then again, I watched it alone at the movie theater, which is always a weird experience for me. Uh, but but watching it again with my daughter, Winter Soldier is really good. Like like they they added depth. They worked harder than they needed to on that movie, and I was really proud to see that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, uh... it's hard to have a movie have actual heart and emotion in a scene where they're talking to a sentient Nazi computer and, <laughs> from the and 1970s. It's like, <laughs> it's like, I mean, it is basically like out of like the Batman a, a TV show that it's like, 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 ah, I've been stalling you. So the missiles can blow up this building. <laughs> like, exactly. Spoiler alert. Uh, <laughs> and yet it feels it never feels like super cheesy because you, you understand Steve Rogers, you understand Natalia Romanoff. Like uh, you have that very human, uh, you know, like a scene with them getting to the facility. Like it's just, it's so well done. Well, what, I plus loved, is it, what I loved about winter soldier was it was like the first time we had a sequel or whatever, a follow up about a superhero where it wasn't like, ah, being a superhero, it's hard. The angst, ah, it was about, uh, I've got a moral code, guys. Um, you've deviated from it. Now I got to do what I got to do. Yeah, I, I, it was. It went beyond the sort of like, how do they deal with their powers? It was not. It was not that at all. It's like, how do you deal with the world that's different than you? Well, yes. Um, well, okay. Here's what's weird, and and I think I enjoyed um, the Winter Soldier more having been through the production ringer. Um, and understand like there are certain things that they're going to demand is that your star power get people to take the mask off as often as they possibly can. 
And like they figured out a plausible scenario where fully a third of the movie, uh, you know, Steve Rogers has the mask off. And when he does put on the mask, it's the, you know, there's a plausible excuse for why it's the retro old fashioned, you know, armor and so on. Um, like there, there's a lot of moving pieces that really work out well. And uh, my only regret is that is that I am completely ignorant of whether or not Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is any good as a result of that storyline. Because it's like I, I, I watched the pilot and I wasn't in love with the pilot and I've never gone back. People tell me that at that post the Winter Soldier storyline, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has suddenly gotten really good. But I, I mean, I, I don't know. I haven't watched it. I, I really want to believe that. I, I that's what <laughs> you and I really me are the same that. guy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> yeah. So uh, gentlemen, we ready to start this yeah, weird thing? Yeah, I think we are. Let me go ahead and boot up the audio recording. Delete everything that came before. Uh, let's see. Check it a diddly ding dong do Brian Brushwood's coming in at just under. Let me do this. Check, 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 check. I'm peaking at negative three. Let me hear Andrew. Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm talking to my iPad because I'm too lazy to start Skype on my computer, even though it restarted. All right, Justin. Yo, what's going on? Here to say that I'm talking to Brian in a major way. <laughs> All right, let me hear you get angry and that upset was about fresh. something. Uh, I just don't know why the fuck is that Whoa! thing. Oh, easy there. All right. Yep. We're all good. Uh, let me delete all of that. And we're going to record in five, four, three, two. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hey, what's up, everybody? Watching a lot of TV these days. I'm Justin Robert Young. Hey, what's up, everybody? Eating a lot of food these days. <laughs> I uh, I spent the last few days in Florida cleaning out a warehouse. Oh my! One of the things I threw out was uh, see that, that if you're watching this live, the video that one of like a couple of those armatures that Justin's using right now, his old podcast table, everything, everything. Wait, uh, no, these this came from from the warehouse, and really this. Uh, podcast is is a fruit of that warehouse. It no. was the first podcast was recorded in there with just me and Andrew, and we're like, "This stinks. We need to add somebody." So uh, we we called Brian <laughs> and, and Eric, that's Veronica Belt. They wouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. So 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 help me out. When you're talking about the warehouse, you mean the warehouse that I used to visit in Florida? It's gone, and like 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 where Justin would sit as we did the BB Live show. Where there Justin was, wrapped three warehouses. Yeah, but the latest iteration of that all gone. All of them are gone now. Yeah. So There's, yeah, we basically we moved from from the two that I was in that that I I worked in. We uh, we moved all that stuff into another warehouse that was not like didn't have an office like the other two were, but it was still like literally just everything that went from there just went to that other uh, that other place. And now, uh, like like the rocket casing falling uh, back to Earth, it is uh, it is it is no more, and we now orbit. The planet yeah, podcast Escape velocity. You know what? I'm okay with this. Like, like I know this is the part where where we should be all sad or whatever. Like, hey, remember that place? But oh. it's like I'm not sad. Like every single person on this podcast right now is in such a better place. Uh, I, I'm I'm freaking thrilled. Congratulations! You 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 you're in orbit. You're in you're among the angels oh. now. It was good. Very very good. So, gentlemen, speaking of orbit and speed and all that. Last week, Mr. Elon Musk unveiled the latest Tesla. And this isn't a Tesla store. I'm just getting to a point about that. Okay. But, but, yeah. but, but we can't say he whipped out the D. He did. Uh, he whipped out the D. And as we talked about here, just repeating the punditry we had, it ended up being a dual motor Tesla. And I threw out there that perhaps it would be like comparatively to a McLaren because that's a standard. And, and actually, it actually has like comparative speeds to a McLaren. It can do zero to sixty in three point one seconds. Which, which again, for, for for those of you who do not aren't familiar with with what the the McLaren acceleration speed means, it is the industry standard for the fastest car that you could just buy and not have designed as like a, something that is designed to go extraordinarily fast. It is it is a production car that goes as fast as production cars go. So, Tesla now selling 
an electric car that goes wicked, 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 wicked fast. Hot, the top end, like I don't remember what they said specifically the top end, but it might be around 155 or something to that effect, whatever. We're entering an age where with uh, – forget for a moment you know, just cars that are uh, necessarily like comp- robot-controlled cars that can move. But getting the cars that already have, they're like BMWs had technologies where they can actually look and see speed signs. They can see all the cars around them. Cars, these kind of automated cars can go faster, much more safely than a human driving one. Yeah. Is there a need at some point in the future as this automation increases and you look at the way we, way we do HOV lanes and the way we do commuter lanes, et cetera, is there – should we start a – a super, super highway, if you will? Uh, no. What we need to do is take second-class citizens, i.e. stupid, human, sloppy, mistake-ridden, wetware human drivers, and and throw them onto, onto the ghettos of the freaking uh, frontage road, and we just need to uh, preserve the lanes for computers. Look, the faster we get humans off their stupid fingers, off the stupid wheels, the safer we'll all be and the faster we'll all get there. Well, but but in the interim, in the, in the interim, before that point, could we, could you see, let's take stretches of highway, some interstate highways and take that left lane, like where we have HOV lanes, where we have that and say, you know what, let's make these high speed lanes. If oh, you're computer so, controlled. So, so, so you're saying don't build anything, just change the paint job. Uh, on stuff For, until and we declare. Build. Until we build. No, 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 no. Yeah, no. Well, well, first of all, I, I mean, okay. So, so, so this is something. There, there's some councilman uh, in Austin, and and I heard this story third hand, so it almost certainly is wrong. But he essentially was saying like, well, I hired a bunch of famous scientist people, and they all agree that if nothing changes in five years. Uh, it will take seven hours to get from South Austin to North Austin because our infrastructure is so terrible or whatever. And it's like the moment I hear this, I think, uh, I, I, dude, it won't matter. In, 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 in 15 years, cars you know, will be driving themselves. They'll be traveling at 80 miles an hour, 12 inches apart, and, and this won't be a factor. We'll have the throughput because we have the exper- expertise in there. Well, but like, like, at what point do you hit critical mass on that? Like, I, I think for, for what... Andrew's saying is in the same way that they're, you know, that that uh, in, in the 90s, you had some highways that just took out speed limits in like, you know, uh, Montana and stuff like that, that you could have areas that are, you know, like, let, let's 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 take a look at going from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Right. Which uh, on the five, you had uh, Elon Musk make the the pitch for the the Hyperloop or something like that. That's a lot of farmland in which you are just kind of going as fast as you can. What if on that highly traveled route where two between two cities where you have a lot of of Teslas or or high speed vehicles that you then painted off and said, you want to know what on here on this highway, you can just murder it like you can just go as, as fast as you can, providing you have in the same way that for HOV lanes, if you are a, a low emissions vehicle, you can drive by yourself and be in the HOV lane because you're saving the environment, quote unquote. Uh, this one, you, as long as you have computer guidance, you can go as fast as you want. I, I, I mean, uh, so, so, so what's the question? Like, like how far away from that are we or or is that a good idea? And I think we're all in agreement that it's a good idea. Right? Of course. Yeah. No, I, I, I think so. Um, I think you're right. I hadn't really considered the whole like painting off things because I was trying to. F- I've been thinking about the problem of how to sell the general public on the idea of cars driving themselves. Because on the upside, you have the demonstrable fact that in every quantifiable category, they will be better and it will be safer. And the quicker you get humans off of the driving uh, the steering wheel, the better off we'll be. On the flip side, you have the fact that we know for a fact that the first time... A, one of these cars rolls over a kid, it's going to be, you know, the robots are killing us. We can't have I, robot-driven cars. I don't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, because, like, I think that, like, you look, we've already had a fatality in a Tesla, and and that was a blip, you know. Well, no, no, I, I mean, you say that, but we had a fire in a Tesla that did not involve a fat- fatality, like, what, like two or three or whatever, but enough that that, that became a media firestorm. And, and- that died. Uh, what's that? 
then it then it because it was this first big deal and people are looking for you know you have you have a market that's looking for news to talk about they talked about it and then Tesla's doing fine now as a company. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean they, they, they are now, is, but they saw like what, like a fifty point dip as a result of that on their stock valuation, right? Although, although I, I kind of feel like we're in we're in a very very weird place right now where anybody who like I would say probably if you are five years younger than me, you will be the last of the people who think being in the news for twenty four hours used to mean something. Oh you know, my God. If, if if it was if it made the nightly news two nights in a row, it was officially a thing with a capital T. Yeah. And now that's just not the case. You know, like the, the threshold for what we care about is just in a totally different place now that we have so many different media outlets. Uh, so it's like for us, yeah, like that Tesla fire thing was on our radar for two, three days. But that's because we pay a lot of attention to technology and Tesla in, in specific and the market just uh, I think like they are also catching up like the rest of us and just don't know how to react to stuff like that because for all these brokers, you know, again, that should be something that damages Tesla's brand for years. And yet now we're paying attention to and, and uh, raining hosannas on like what it can go 150 miles an hour and drive itself like which is completely counterintuitive to whether uh, if we actually gave if we actually gave credence to the idea that their batteries are vulnerable and fires break out. So, speaking of which, uh, I, I I don't know. Did this happen since the last time we did weird things? I know the last time we talked about the uh, the the Model D, we you know didn't know what it was, but but since then we've seen released video that shows it driving itself, recognizing signs and and barreling down highways. Um, is it, uh, I, should we talk about that real quick? Like like, did you guys see sure. that video? Did you like it? Uh, I don't know if I saw that video. Wait, really? Oh, really? No, it's very cool. Uh, let, let me do this. I'll try to pull it up right now. I think it was, I'll go to news.google.com and I'll type in. So this was at the, the, uh, the, the unveiling the, where Elon Musk, uh, unleashed the D and was very, uh, very, uh, peckish about, uh, the fact that he had realized and was given a very swift education on the puns of, uh, the D and made all the D jokes that he could in a polite fashion. Uh, but then they, they took a lot of the journalists on a test track and it was actually right outside of where we were, uh, next to the SpaceX facility in Hawthorne. Uh, they, they had uh, all that, that back area, uh, roped off and they demonstrated two things primarily for which Brian, I'm sure will be bringing up visuals uh, momentarily. If you were watching this in video format, uh, yeah, yeah, to be honest, like I, I just pulled up his speech, but I realized his speech would take too long, but instead uh, slash gear did a little demo where they did a ride along. It's only like a minute long here. So this is, yeah, this is what, this is what they did. And it was very, very smart. They demonstrated two elements. Number one, what zero to 60 felt like in the, in the quick acceleration, which they did through a, a, a raver neon tunnel, which I thought was a good touch. Oh no, and it's then, so great, man. It's like, it's like you're driving through Tron world, man. They're, they, they, they handled it really well. And then on the back end showed coming back to the start point, it on assisted driving mode, wherein it locked into cruise control at a certain point. It, uh, automatically moved lanes from one lane to another uh, to avoid another car and recognized, which I don't know whether or not it's through opti uh, uh, optical recognition or it just internally in, in, in the computer, it just knows I, what. I believe, I believe they said, I believe like at some point you hear the guy say it recognizes the speed limit posted here. Yeah, so, it so, has a camera that scans for that. Right, so, okay. so here, take, 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 take a look at this right here. And audio listeners, um, enjoy the virtual what it means in your mind. So right now you see people uh, as if they're launching planes off an aircraft carrier in Tron world, sending people down a track. And here's the reaction as somebody experiences acceleration. All right, there we go. <laughs> that, yeah, that's fast. Fastest <laughs> four-door sedan in the world, you say? Ever. Ever. So we're now going to turn on the autopilot system. Okay. Engaging it now. My hands are now off the steering wheel, my foot is off the accelerator. The car will observe the 30 mile an hour sign and increase its speed as we go through this bend. You see it's following the lines in the road. 
and as it observes this 25 mile an hour speed, it's going to reduce. I'm gonna click the turn signal and we're gonna move over one lane completely on its own. And it's now going to observe the car in front and come to a nice gentle stop. Wow. All right, so so this obviously throws, when we last discussed this, we were, uh, I, I, I think it was uh, you, Andrew, who said like, well, there's no way this is going to be a production vehicle that does all the driving on its own, but maybe like a single Tesla that they would show off. Like, like, I meant autonomous like the Google cars. Right, yeah. right, 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 right. But 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 as I understand it now, there it's it, as as they phrase it, ninety percent autonomous driving, and it looks like a production model, right? No, oh, yeah. It's so so they, we've had lane assist. We've already had lane assist. We've had self parking. These things are production things. It's the rest of it where you put your kid into the car and let it get you there because it's understanding the person standing in the middle of the road trying to wave you off and all that. That's the last gap, and that's the hardest one to bridge. And even Musk says, you know, we're five, 10 years away from there. So that, that was these. So these features I think are great there. These former features have already been in, you know, like the BMW has the speed thing, lane system. And I think Tesla's the first one put all together. These things aren't, were not ever under question. It was the idea of you tell it where you want to go. You sit back and it gets you from point A to point B without you having to touch the steering wheel. That's the hardest part. Well, okay. And what's funny is like, like I, I, I didn't realize that that was the uncanny valley of self-driving cars. Like if that's the case, like if all I have to do is pull out of my driveway and then get on 290 and then, and then say, you know, take me to Dallas. And then from between there and Dallas, I can read, you know, an Andrew Main novel. Uh, it's like, that, that's amazing, man. Are you kidding me? Well, that's good uh, enough uh, for me. Uh, the, the question is, is that, that uh, will they, you know, the, you know, it's it, like the technology having there is incredible. It can spot moving soft objects, as Elon Musk talks about, moving across the highways, things like that, and can warn you. It's, you know, the goal is get into the backseat like an Uber and it takes you there. Yeah. And uh, that's, yeah. Well, and, and that's, that'll be, that's going to fundamentally change. And these all incremental things are great. The future doesn't happen all at once. It happens in bits and pieces. And, you know, you know, you can, I was amazed like two years ago, I went to go get a car and I found that like, I didn't know at that time that you could actually just buy cars that would park themselves, that would auto parallel park. Yeah. I had no idea that it was that was a production model level thing that you have. And there's a lot of things that's really cool. It's that last, you know, that last thing that when the cops out in the middle of the road waving you off to the side, you know, that's the that's the danger part. These cars still can't deal with. Yeah. Speaking but, of which, I mean, but, but what we have here and granted, again, this is a high market automobile. You know, this is this is going to be a very, very pricey little item. And uh, the, the big question is, is that as Tesla, you know, who has made very, very specific and calculated moves with the gigabit factory to bring, uh, you know, battery capacity up and the price on those batteries down, if that's the kind of stuff that becomes why you buy a Tesla vehicle that is not at the absolute top of the of, of of the auto food chain something more like the the four-door hatchback that they're that, that that they're coming out with that's like slightly more on the level of a upper middle class family well and this is this is also one of those uh big leaps forward in that uh if i'm somebody let's say you know somebody who's who is is fairly affluent uh but but in suburbia like uh zero to sixty that's a great number, and I understand the reason that everybody does that. But it's like, let's face that. Uh, let's face it. If you got, you know, two kids that you're getting to school, you're not going to rely on that a lot. Uh, never going into a gas station. That's more practical, right? You know, charging stations or whatever. You know, it's like if you give a comparative cost analysis, it is somewhat cheaper to charge at home rather than you know uh, paying for for uh, hydrocarbon fuel or whatever. But when you suddenly promise someone free time. When uh, oh, we were talking about this in another context, we talk about this with the Apple Watch. Uh, the idea on one level, the Apple Watch is ridiculous because, well, if you get a message, why don't you take the three seconds to pull out your phone? 
empires are built on saving people three seconds at a time. And this is a case where all of a sudden you can unlock for every soccer mom out there who has to get from point A to point B, needs to update everything and respond to the email and cancel Taekwondo and do blah, 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 blah. If all of a sudden you could say, get your husband to spend 20000 more dollars on this and all that time opens up, like it is a new world. It is unbelievable the difference that it makes. Well, you know, I think what's interesting too, like what Musk has talked a lot about with Tesla is that pushing these technologies eventually through all of the models. So the idea that when they have their $30,000 car four years from now, that these features will be in there. And that, you know, because you do get that, you know, like the Apple model is that, you know, if we buy, you know, if we buy 20 million of these A7 or A8 chips, we can put them in everything. You know, and then it becomes, you know, that that idea of that that keep pushing that high end, not trying to you know, like the conventional wall, trying to price these things, you know, as as pluses, but make them basic features, and then the market just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Speaking, and we've of which, already seen that with, with with the supercharger system. Yeah, you know, like like they they have made that when when we were at that facility that I guess they did uh, part of the the uh, the announcement for for the D. Uh, that's a huge part in their showroom. That is as much a part of why you should buy a Tesla as the technology and the car itself is look at everywhere that you can go and charge for free and how fast it is. Well, you're buying into an ecosystem and a system, yeah. you know, and in, and in that regard, I think uh, Andrew is 100 percent right uh, in that it's very Apple like. And in fact, since our, our, our previous um, uh, discussion, I've softened a bit and it's like uh, I, oh, the latest episode of brand things. Brand things, yeah. Uh, like, like I still don't know if you're right or if it's the right call, but I firmly decided that I hope you're right. And uh, in like, like the cynic in me, st you know, just says like the car market is, you know, increasingly fragmented or whatever. And I don't want to bring it up again, but 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 I, like I'm on your side that it's like I hope that's what they do and I hope it works out because uh, and it may be the right play if for no other reason because Elon has mentioned very directly like. We need competition. Like we're the only player in this market, and there's no way the markets can survive if we're the if we define the fringe. We need more people playing this game. So that's why we're releasing our patents, or not really releasing, but sub licensing their patents and so on. Yeah, we'll see. You know, I mean, it's you know consumer behavior and, and what motivates people. It's gonna you know it's it's it's, it's a guessing game ultimately. I mean, I, and and. You know, we'll see. So back to the question of the super, how, how I was thinking about, cause we had talked about like, oh, we need high speed rail. We need all these, these trillion dollar initiatives and stuff like that. But how cool would it be if they said, you know what, we're going to open up the, you know, the nation's highways. We're going to have a high speed, you know, thing that you can go 200 miles an hour. And if you're an electric car and you start thinking about how that changes transportation. So, I mean, huge, especially if, if we hit a critical mass on people who have electric cars that can go 200 miles an hour, right? Uh, that, that is a, that, that's a huge uh, piece to it. The question would be, are, are these lanes, do we take out another lane of a five-lane highway where now one is by time windows and HOV lane that nobody who is by themselves can go in? Like, do we now have another lane further to the left of that that's the 200 mile lane uh and and we have now three lanes for general uh the the, the gen pop i think we look at the idea of saying that over time you know making in certain areas where you can do it the left lane as we've done it with the hov we start saying they're they they can be for high speed electric vehicles high speed autonomous vehicles and it won't be every highway but it might be the idea of let's start doing that where you take corridors you know you take you know, it's 381 miles from L.A. to San Francisco. Yeah. Now, if you can go 150 miles an hour the bulk of the way, it's a two and a half hour flight. It's going to it's a two and a half hour drive. It's actually going to be faster than flying if you count airport time and all that. And well, you that, know, that, that's one of the things like uh, 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 Jaime Ruiz, uh, tensor guy in the chat, uh, joined us for a couple of days this week because he's in Austin and uh, thinking about living here. Uh, he talked about how amazing the experience was riding the bullet trains in Europe. And all I could think of, you know, it's like he was like, no, no, no. It gets up to like 200 miles an hour. It's all like, well, that's very, very fast. Uh, but it's less fast when you have to stop every, you know, uh, 30 minutes to let people on and off or whatever. It's like you don't need to go quite 200 miles an hour. Like you could average again. It's like when I was in high school, 
I figured out real fast that it didn't matter that you got 95 on every paper. It only took one zero to seriously distort your average down to a B or B minus, right? And yeah. uh, and I feel like that's that's what I feel like with all the existing other modes of transportation and even uh, you know you know trains or light rail or any you know, that that's a high amount of in- infrastructure you have to spend money to build and then um, uh, it inherently slows down as you try to please the most amount of people. This is what I love about about the D. <laughs> and I love saying that, uh, uh, is that is that it is customized per person and it doesn't need to hit 200 miles an hour. If it hits 100 miles an hour, it suddenly becomes the best transportation option there is out there, especially if not only does it hit that speed, get priority access, but you're able to read an important business paper in the two hours that it takes you from get, to get from point A to point B. Then it matters. Like, it doesn't matter how physically fast you get there. What we care about is our productivity hours. And if you can not look at the steering wheel, if you can not look at the road, if you can get work done and not have to stop for other people to get on and off, this is in every way. And oh, and by the way, you know, uh, uh, reduce carbon emissions because it's an electric vehicle, blah, 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 and all that stuff. It's, it's the perfect solution, right? And I'll give you another thing to think about, too, is like, you know, when we start, it's hard to compare other systems in other places. The distance from London to Paris is shorter than the distance from L.A. to San Francisco. Yes. So, you know, it's it's one of these things where you, you connect the major, you know, we, we could put most of the European capitals inside of Texas. Uh, wow. Say that again. <laughs> we could put most of the we could take most of the European capitals. You mean the distances the between Texas. you? You don't just mean like we can fit all the capitals in Texas. You mean we could fit the distances between all those capitals in Texas? Many, yeah. If you took, let's say, like London, Paris, maybe like Frankfurt, whatever, you could put them. You know, you could put you could drop drop Texas over that. You could put Greece, London, Italy, and France all in in Texas. How about that? Far, but close, close, probably. <laughs> I, 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 listen, uh, well, this is Andrew's pitch for a bullet train from Dallas to El Paso. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, dude. Nobody should have to drive that. <laughs> it's brutal. It's brutal. It's a brutal drive. So, we're all, all in favor. Say aye. 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 Dude, aye. I will buy one as soon as I have the money and the means and the ability. Well, Brian, let me tell you what. Um, you're looking at a, a huge, huge Uber user here. Wait, you're, you're a big old Uber user? I use Uber all the time. Dude. Uh, it, okay, tell, tell me if this is just me, but it's like there are a few times, like one of my favorite things on the in the world is discovering somebody who hasn't discovered the joy of Uber before, like who knows it's a thing but hasn't used it. And they're like, no, I, 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 I was just going to get a cab, and I just want to punch them. I'm like, get a cab? <laughs> what? what? <laughs> What are you talking about? Get a cab. He's like, what, what are you going to negotiate your fee? Figure out what to give in a tip. Ugh. Watch the advertisements on the built-in video. While you, ah. Man, I'll tell you what. I, we, Me and my brother went to this music festival on Treasure Island, which is the island between Oakland and San Francisco. No public transportation there except for buses. They ran shuttles that were just packed you know, to, to the rafters. So from Oakland, we're right on the highway. We Ubered in and we Ubered back and Ubering back was a pain in the butt, but it was like, it was like a $70 thing. It was easy to split it on the phone. And so we each paid 30 bucks to get back with like buyer in a car by ourselves with a dude who was like very aggressive in, in muscling his way through traffic. And we were very thrilled by that service. Well, and plus also keep in mind, like, like that is like, think about how pleased you are with Uber as it is now. And that still has the overhead of a, of a wetware person in between you and what you really want, which is to move to, from point A to point B. Like, like how fast is that going to change once you subscribe to uh, Googler, uh, you know, the Google Uber alternative or whatever? Yeah, I think, and that's going to be. I think that's going to be how a lot of these technologies filter their ways down to us. Is that maybe we're not going to go out and buy ourselves the big hundred thousand dollar electric car, but if we want to get from here to point A to point B, and this thing is running twenty four seven nonstop, then it becomes like Uber has said. The head of the company flat out said, "Oh yeah, we eventually want to go autonomous." So if you're an Uber driver, you're like, "Ah, oh, thanks." That's great. <laughs> well, they, they also, you know, I mean, I mean, they already know that. They, they've already felt the pinch because there's been like a renegotiation of of how uh, payments are distributed or, or or whatever. I mean, it's like they kind of. 
it's it's weird because I, every Uber driver I've talked to, and I don't know, you know, obviously they have a motive of agreeing with whatever it is I, I wonder or appear to think, but it's like, it seems like they're all thrilled to be working for Uber instead of a cab company. And many of them do come from a cab company background and they're like, no, it's great. There's no dispatcher. I get to pick my own things. I get to do X, Y, and Z or whatever. Um, but I think they also feel the impending changes coming in the next 10 years. I mean, can we agree that 10 years from now, uh, driving anyone driving anything is going to look like a stupid waste of time, even though drivers of things is like like 20% of the job market? I, I uh, Brian, I, I, I want to be 10, in that future. I, don't know. Like, I just I, think I, uh, the way things move so slowly, it won't happen until then. Will it much later? Go, go, go ahead, Justin. Yeah, I don't I don't know if we in 10 years are looking at, at like the cars that drive themselves or like it it just being more pervasive to have these autopilot kind of functionalities where you know it would it would be more gauche to have their hands on the wheel but you still have somebody that is there and can drive them, you know, drive stuff themselves and and you know if if for whatever reason the autopilot is glitching on pulling into an alley where it's easier to drop you off. They can just click it off autopilot and just do it well, manually. And, and, and keep in mind, I also, I chose my words carefully here because uh, I, I don't mean that it'll be uncommon to see people driving themselves. Um, but I think it will look silly to us. Like, like I think 10 years from now, it will be familiar enough to see people put in a thing and then just, it goes and there will be areas and situations where it's well, like, give me, no, give me, give me an analog. Give me like, what is something that looks silly now that Ooh. was, was texting common 10 Te years, uh, texting, texting with, with, uh, 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 two, 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 five, 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 one, eight, 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 you know, like, 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 uh, T nine texting or whatever, like, like that's just silly now. And it's not, and now keep in mind, like that's, that's the driver of industry. People are, are negotiating, you know, prices for, for various, uh, grown commodities and agriculture in, in Africa right now, but the rest of us are using smartphones. You know, it's like that's that's the nor that's the new normal, and it's it hasn't even been ten years since uh, the iPhone has been introduced. But now, you know, we three expect to do this, and when you know when your grandpa pulls out, you know, thing and starts texting on a T nine interface using a number pad, it just looks silly. Like that's what I think it'll be like. Like it's practical, it works, it gets you from point A to point B. I ain't gonna judge. But it's just a little silly. Or, or maybe even a BlackBerry. BlackBerry, let's face it, a little silly. Silly, kind of silly to have a BlackBerry now with your little physical keyboard and whatnot. I, I, I predict that in 10 years, the majority of production cars will have some things like lane assist, speed, line, speed sign recognitions and stuff. All the features we're seeing the Tesla now, I think most cars will have in 10 years. But I think our hands are going to be on the wheels 95% of the time 10 years from now. Oh man, dude! I'll bet you. I'll bet you the case, but I'll I bet you twenty whole dollars that that's not the case. Well, uh, certainly for the three of us, I would say I will say ten years from now, I'll bet you twenty dollars that ten years from now, all three of us own cars that that at some point allow us to take the hands off the wheel at production at, at full speed. What well, I think I think most people have cars that have that. I think they'll have that, but uh, you know, I guess we have to define what we're you know the whole. Uh, you know, the, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's, we have to define specifically what we mean. Well, I, think, well, to, to, I will to, say to this. I, I find this version of the popular idea of the future far more appetizing and plausible than what I think it was 10 or 15 years ago where we were all crazy about huge, gigantic light rail and, and public transportation things that like, that, that, that used to be the way when, when, when people would say, well, here's what transportation is going to be in 15 years. Very often, that was the futurist way of thinking. And, and I like this version a lot better, and I find it to be more realistic. Yeah, and, and keep in mind, it sounds to me like, like Andrew and I are, are thinking in, in terms uh, like, like Andrew – uh, forgive me if I'm wrong here, but it sounds like you're talking about the goal of completely autonomous. You dial in and a car without a driver shows up. You hop in and off you go. Whereas I'm thinking of just let me unlock 30 minutes of this trip. If I can unlock 30 minutes of this trip to, you know, this two hour journey to Waco or, or, or you know, Houston or whatever, it's like that to me, I am happy. And it's like from there, anything beyond that is gravy. You know, just give me a little bit of highway time to open up. And I, and I feel like certainly 10 years from now, all three of us will have cars 
that once we get on the highway, we can open up and start doing other stuff, right? I want that. <laughs> All right, but but you don't you don't think it'll happen? I don't. I don't. Again, By then, it, it comes down to the 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 the. the the fear is that people will get this and will be very, very comfortable with it and will fall asleep when the car tells them they have to take the wheel because there's, you know, an accident or something in the road. Or that you're going to get people who are going to rely on this when it's not the point that it should – when their attention will be fully disengaged at points when it should not be because in five seconds it can all of a sudden be, hey, this, compu- this, can- this car can't handle this. And that's my fear is that, is that you know, the, the thing we want is I always want to lean back and take a nap, but – I don't think will be. I don't think production cars will be there in ten years, for the most case. I, I think they will because that's not that hard. Especially think about this: um, if what we're proposing is taking the far left lane and painting it off for automated vehicles only, then uh, it gets to the point where it alerts and says, you know, please take charge of the vehicle. And if you don't, that's the nice thing about being in the left hand lane is that it could just pull over on the shoulder on the left. And just park until it's like, well, when you're ready to take the well, control, we could do that, you know. But, but you know, if there is one thing, and, and to take Tesla as an example, the, the fire in the batteries were a story because somebody took a video of it. And, and so it was interesting and compelling video to see a Tesla on fire because of what it is as an object in our popular culture. What would have been actually damaging to the Tesla brand are – repeated and sustainable stories of people getting stranded trying to go from one place to another because the battery was not at the capacity that Tesla promised it, right? Right. And that could have severely damaged the brand of of what Tesla is and what it wants to be. If autonomous cars, they will have a five-year proving period of is this – a, worth the premium that you're no doubt going to have to pay for it. And B, like, you don't want to be pulling over to the side of the road. You don't, you don't want to have, you know, uh, th- those sort of failures because before it becomes a standard, it's going to go through, I think, a huge, huge proving ground. And if it doesn't hit it, then I think we're going to be – it will be very easy to me to find that timeline, even an aggressive 10-year timeline, bump back if there are just – you know, public perception failures. I think that what you're saying is a hundred percent reasonable and it is a hundred percent the way people tend to think of things, but also like we've seen dramatic, dramatic changes in, uh, uh, cultural changes, massive things that, that I, you know, and you know, the, the, the old canard is the, is, is the, you know, the gay marriage example, you know, 20 years ago, people are like, well, of course, gay marriage will be acceptable, but it won't be till 2050. And then we see something very fast because if, if, uh, obviously at this point, it's not the technology and we certainly don't expect the technology will be a limiting factor five years from now or 10 years from now. It sounds like everybody here is like, well, cultural changes, people won't be ready for this. I, I, I think I, they will. I think they will I faster they, than you I think. I think, no, I think there's a big, I think there's a, there's, there is a, that last, I think there's a technology gap that's still, there are these really hard problems. Like I use, I use a road all the time that whenever there was, whenever there's a show at the Hollywood bowl, they have cops out there with cones redirecting traffic. And it is confusing to me to figure out which cop I have to pay attention to. And if I don't, I will murder people. <laughs> and, and, and these are the situations that concern me. It's not so much the cultural things. Remember, like, the biggest leap that happened in the third world, technologically speaking, was the introduction of cell phone towers. They had telephones, but because the government controlled the telephone lines and the telephone systems, and the government could regulate those things, they were very slow to roll out, very slow to change. You know, in, like, 1990 in Kenya, you had only 40,000 telephones for a population of like 30 million. Cell phones come along and all you need to do is just pop up a tower and it was a lot easier because they didn't really know how to regulate or control that other than just say, yeah, sure, you can have this wavelength. Boom, everybody gets phones. Cars, highways, government transportation, that's the thing is once we say, well, there's a million different regulations that come into play there and there's a lot of people, I can't even legally use an Uber to get from LAX to Fort Lauderdale. That's true. That's true. Uh, um, a very wise man once told me, Andrew Main, and it, it, he said something that changed my life because I used to be like really bent out of shape about, about the legality of this or that or of governments telling me to do X, Y, or Z. And he said to me, uh, technology outpaces legislation. And, uh, and it changed everything. By the way, it was you 
Uh, uh, but but uh, which, by the way, is is a brilliant, brilliant phrase, and I love that. It's true, man. Technology does outpace legislation. Whatever the problem is, and whatever it is you're worried about, the government creeping in on. Uh, technology is advancing at too fast a rate for for legislation to keep I, up with. So I think I, it will well, be so. Sorry, Andrew. Go. I just say I love the fact that right now we have the head of the FBI and the FBI is an agency I respect. They do, you know, uh, they are a premier law enforcement agency in the world. I love the fact the head of it is upset with Google and Apple because Google and Apple have said, um, no, we're going to allow customers to encrypt their data because we think that's a right. Yeah. You know, and that we have major two of the biggest corporations in the world are saying, no, we're going to stand on the side of your individual rights to protect in your privacy. Hey, they're. There is, and I hope it it comes to light, but like from what you have kind of seen reading between the lines of as this prism and, and Snowden stuff broke, the idea that all these major companies were compelled not only to hand over data to the government, but were also compelled uh, under penalty of, of treason from talking about their their complicity in that, like when you talk about the egos in Silicon Valley, being told things that you know that they can't talk about and they have to willfully look like hypocrites as they step out and talk about user privacy and everything and then not be able to even come clean on the decisions that they made like that's I, it's a fascinating story that I hope gets told. Well, and to be, to be honest, also, like along the, those lines, um, uh, longtime listeners know that uh, I'm very excited because uh, Google Fiber is coming to Austin, Texas. And as a preemptive move, AT&T, to compete, has upgraded everyone to their Gigafiber stat, uh, status, which, uh, you know, six months ago, it was like a dream come true. We had 300 megabit up and uh, like 50 megabit. I'm sorry, uh, uh, 300 megabit down, 50 megabit up. And then now we're at a full, we, you know, I just did a speed test. It was 900 megabits uh, down and 300 megabits up. And the question is like, well, at this point, I could stream all the video I want. And it's slightly more convenient when I'm uploading production files to an FTP or whatever. But beyond that, what do we do with all this extra bandwidth? And the answer is obvious. What you do is you start to, obs uh, to offer the luxury of everything being encrypted automatically uh, by default, like essentially you're in a private secure environment at all times. You don't need to run a VPN. You don't need to whatever, blah, 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 blah. And I, and I think that one of the major ISPs is going to have uh, a moment when they realize they can jump to the front of the line by branding themselves as the secure place where it's like you truly are going out in private every time you leave the house. Can I give you a side just on the side of the technology thing? So you have... Google, Apple, and Microsoft will say the, the three, three of the leading consumer-facing technology companies are, right? Sure, yeah. Google and Apple have been very outspoken about their urge to defend and protect and to stand up to, you know, this. Another company has been kind of quiet. <laughs> uh, Google, uh, wait, you say Microsoft? Yeah. And, Microsoft? And Facebook, too. Yeah, Facebook, too. But, uh, yeah, you know, what I say is, is that, uh, but, you know, Microsoft has not been, you know, as very... Well, it's funny because, like, even people who are fairly savvy in the tech world. For example, uh, Bonnie is, is uh, Bonnie's like the fittest she's ever been. She's running every day and, uh, and, and she dieted and she hit all of her goals and she's really excited. And I was like, Hey, well you should, uh, uh, sign up for uh, map my run and, uh, and my fitness pal. And, and then that way, you know, it, it'll upload your weights and you can keep track of all that stuff and we could share stuff with each other. And so she goes to do it and she's like, well, I guess I'll just use my Facebook login. And I was like, I was like, well, why? She's like, well, why not? And, uh, she's like, well, it's just so convenient. You press the button and then it's in there. I was like, well, you know who it's most convenient for are the advertisers who are buying your running data and are going to start marketing statin inhibitors to you. Uh, you know, if, if, to, to, to lower your cholesterol because they've, they've figured out that you very likely, you know, have fallen off the wagon at this moment or that moment. And like she, it just never occurred to her, you know, she looked at the personal benefit like, it's very easy. Click the Facebook button. But again, like there's a reason that it's so easy. And it's like, you know, if you don't know what, um, you're paying for, then you're the product, right? Yeah. I, 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 I will, you know, a little moment of shilling from it. I like the opt-in on my iPhone for stuff. And so, like, I opted in for, like, my passbook for locations, and I can shut it off, and they, they are very good about, you know, they're a company that makes their money selling you products. They, their ad, iAds has not been a very successful initiative for them, and they're not really into tracking. But I love the fact I turn on passbook. I'm at Walgreens, and the girl says, oh, do you have your Walgreens card? I'm like, hold on. I go pull out my phone, and the Walgreens card's already loaded up. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm like, oh, this is the future. You know? Oh, wait, so it knows you're at Walgreens? It knew and, I was yeah. at Walgreens. It knew that I was there. So when I pulled out, when I reached for my phone and pulled it out, it already had on my notification screen the Walgreens card. I just had to swipe it. Do you use, uh, Brian, do you use Passbook for like your flights? No, I, I, I mainly because I, everyone in front of me, it's so super awkward. Like the guy in front of me is like, like doing this and he's just holding and then he twists it and he's like, well, I mean, it's 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 a valid flight, and then he you know go, does the, and then finally it works, and it's like I don't want to be that guy. No, so Brian, you crap. you saw you saw one person doing the black and white. There's got to be a better way thing. Like <laughs> it is Dude, the future. Like uh, you need uh, you need okay. to start doing burr, 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 burr. Uh, It's not one person. It's it's. Uh, I would say at this point. Um, now keep in mind on on any given flight, there's usually. Uh, we'll say five to 15 people in front of me. There's at least one in every five to 15 group. And it's like, I don't want to risk being that one. And so, Dude, so I will, well, Brian, well, I mean, I, well, and keep in mind also, it's like, how hard is it to walk in and just have a printed out boarding pass? So you don't have to worry about it. Sure. Why not your... hand them some seashells too, Brian, and maybe some shiny objects. Um, the prop, I don't know what, sometimes you hand them the wrong one that doesn't have your TSA pre thing <laughs> on it. And now you have to deal with some assholes at, at Austin being fixed. The problem I've had, That's Brian, why. is like when I, if I use Passbook, it's fine. If I just have my ticket electronically and then I don't get internet at the airport, that's when I've had problems. I'm like, oh no, it's here, really. I'm honest, please. Yeah. When well, it's yeah, Passbook, I guess that's, yeah, that, that's the thing, Brian, is that like, having it right there on the screen makes all the difference. Like, like I don't go into an app and use it, but it's just like, you pull out the phone, you wake it up, swipe once, beep, you're good. Like, and- I, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, what I am describing, and keep in mind, this is not, this is not like a, oh, hold on, let me find it moment. I, I mean, like, the, every time I've seen it fail, and again, I'm not saying this is a bad idea, I'm not saying that it's not the future, I am saying that, that I've seen enough people have it loaded on their screen and have to move it 75 angles before it finally goes bing, 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 and then lets them on the plane. And it was super awkward for them, and I don't want to be part of that club just yet. Fair Man, enough. I don't know where you're going with your crazy phone people, but that's, that is certainly nothing that I have seen to be a, a problem in my flying I, I, I mean, I, 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 well, let, right, real quick, let's just lay it on the table. Like, I fly Southwest, and, and maybe Southwest readers aren't that great or whatever, but but – Every time, if there's 15 people in front of me, at least one of them is slowing down the line with this maneuver. I mean, Maybe, I guess like, you're, I, you're King me, Delta. It, it's people finding their IDs and stuff like that that are are just as much I, of, I, a, I, of a of a time waste. I don't know. This is again, gonna, we, gonna, we went I'm from brand things this. last year to airport security. <laughs> thing. I want to move on to one more topic, um, and I, I I believe Brian's experiences are true to Brian, and 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 that's all we need to say. Um, and that's not a snarky thing. I, I think I, I there's a reason you don't want to use it, and you've made it very, very clear that that's there's there, you need to see enough of it work for you to go okay. And that's totally fair, and valid. Well, well, and, and keep in mind, it's not even like like I, I'm not I, I'm not opposed to using it. It's like I need to see it work well enough that mm-hmm. it's worth not bothering to take thirty seconds to print out a piece of paper. Like, Understood. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Totally agree. Let me move on to one more topic. For Empires we have been made. By saving people 30 seconds. Yeah, wait, a I wise got, well, man okay. said. But, but keep in mind also, I got two hours to spare every flight. Because <laughs> I'm just hanging around thanks to uh, TSA early check-in, whatever. Anyway. All right, gentlemen. We've been talking a lot about far-off stuff, things like that. Now let's talk about immediate technologies that we know the predictions are totally on target and we don't need to second guess. <laughs> All right. Um, Lockheed Martin aims to develop a compact fusion reactor prototype in five years with production units in 10. Okay, look, you can't... Lockheed Martin, we've talked about this. We understand that at the office parties that we have a kegger, and it's great that you're able to drink for free, but you can't go running your mouth off like that around in front of the entire U.S. population. They're going to start to This is the Skunk Works part that said this, too. I, 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 Okay, explain to me... Let's go to our resident uh, smartest person of science, Andrew Main. Explain to me how this might be remotely possible. So, um, there's thing like so. Every article you read on fusion, by the way, they have an obligatory cut and paste. This is what fusion is. I'm yeah. not going to do that to you. Oh, you know, fusions fusing things and getting energy. We'll just leave it at that. Lockheed Martin said that what they were able to do is they looked at all of the other existing fusion reactors. And they said, you know, we took sort of the best ideas from them and combined them into something that's going to be, you know, would fit in the back of a pickup truck, basically, a much smaller unit. 
and we think we think we've solved it and that's been the refrain we've heard from this consistently from fusion but fusion reactors are like a million percent more powerful than they were 20 years ago it's not like they've been sitting there going can't figure it out you know it's like they've been getting better and better but it's that that last gap is the hardest part so lockheed martin says we think we've figured this out we have the thing called a compact fusion reactor safer cleaner whatever and they're saying within five years they'll have a prototype a working prototype and they will be able to make this thing work in like they'll be selling these things in 10 years fusion reactors in 10 years okay. 10 years time 2024 running which on... by the way for for lockheed means we're taking money now right yes like well, if, if if they're saying we will you will have them or we will be selling them in 10 years then that means that they are putting them in government contracts like tomorrow to get paid for them. Okay, real quick, just to re just to take everything full circle, and and I'm not I'm not challenging you guys. Uh, I, I respect all of your opinions. Um, uh, uh, which but is how hard is it to just hold your like phone up to the scanner so you can get it? All right, sorry, go. Ahead. Uh, it, it, uh, it is uh, which do you feel like is more likely? Uh, fully autonomous vehicles on the road, you call it up and you get in it, or production level? Uh, uh, fusion units, uh, which by the way, did they say what they plan for it to run on? Would it be, would it be like what? Like, like, uh, uh heavy water or hydrogen or yeah, what? like tritium, tritium, whatever. Okay. Deuterium. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, which do you think is more likely 10 years from now? I think Lockheed's going to have something they call a fusion reactor that they're going to sell. I mean, they're in the business of selling things like to the government and like, I think that they that is what they have demonstrated they can and will do. Now, will it be the fusion reactor that we kind of hope and and know and and is the game changer that we have thought it could be in our science fiction universe? Uh meh, who knows? Well, but, I mean, by which uh, you said all of those words Justin and all I heard was like will it be Tony Stark's arc reactor? Who knows? <laughs> the the like, critical think that's part the of the bet. fusion reactor is when it puts out more energy than it takes in. Yeah. So, so that's big step number one. You know, almost almost getting to that step is kind of like, well, when we have deliverable isn't as important as long as we know we can do this because we know we will get a production grade version. That's the will we see that a working prototype in five years of a fusion reactor that puts out more energy than it takes in? Hmm. I no. The answer is no. Like uh, the cynic in me says that the safest bet uh, in the Vegas spread, always bet on no with, if there's a deadline involved. And I'll, I'll go to our, our, our uh, sports book, uh, Mizzoula, the Mike Rula, the old schooler on this one, man. Well, let me, let me ask you this, though, Brian, because it seems like you are very, very bullish on a technology for which has a lot of moving parts, right? For, yep. for a driverless car to be uh, pervasive in modern society, there are a ton of hurdles that a lot of people and industries have to sign off on and governments need to approve, right? Right. A fusion reactor, although certainly a seemingly impossible goal, is the domain of one group that is dedicated to bringing it. It would seem like one hurdle is a, a bit, like, although fantastical, slightly easier if they feel like they have the inside track. Well, and this so is... It's Let me throw another wrinkle out there. Sure. So you have another company called Helion, which has been getting some Silicon Valley startup funding, and they say that they're close to also having a production grade. Are there, you know, they're the early stage, but they say they have a model, they have a system for a fusion reactor. So we're getting these startups now, and this is what's exciting to me. This is what's exciting to me is you have Lockheed Martin, and then you have these startups that are building based on credible people this isn't your bs sort of you know uh zero point energy quacks or whatever like this these are real scientists from real places you know with theories that are like based on how do you we know the universe to work now getting startup capital and funding to build fusion reactors i'm excited Oh no no no, and 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 as well we should be, and I and I and I hope it works out. It's just that uh, to Justin's question, like like why am I more bullish on self-driving cars than than fusion reactors in the same amount of time? Uh, one represents an existing technology or or sequence of technologies that have all proven themselves to work 
time and time again. All that takes is is adjusting um, societal infrastructures to accommodate that. And we saw, you know, in 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 you know, twenty or thirty years after the Wright brothers flew, we saw commercial airlines. You know, we saw I, transatlantic I, back, flights and so on. We back up because, like, like, with I see the problem with autonomous car driving is that we still have this big visual gap we have to solve. We still have these these problems that these really, really, really fundamentally hard problems to do with imaging that are still, we're still trying to, you know, the, uh, I don't know if we have an algorithm that can tell the difference between a cat or a dog. I mean, I mean, I guess, I guess, I guess to me, that's not a problem because I can easily see five years from now, every car does, as Elon Musk says, uh, 90% of the driving, but it's just common practice. Like you're reading an article and it goes, bling, bling, uh, situation coming up. I don't know what to do. You'll have to manual override. And then it, you take over and, and, you, and you do your thing. Or the car stops and traffic backs up and everyone's honking at you like, hey, lady, why don't you drive your car? It's like, like to me, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. Uh, getting to 100% is not my, uh, I'm not worried about that at all. Uh, so I feel like we're going to get there and again, unlock hours and hours and hours of, of, of human productivity every single day per person whereas the fusion thing number one you've you've, you've got fuel concerns because uh you know like let's say they have the tech first of all number one it sounds like they don't have the technology now it sounds like they plan to have the technology in five or ten years uh which again is a, is, a, is a delicate thing to announce that you have number two i mean are you essentially setting up a a uh, monopoly market for you know deuterium or heavy water or whatever the fuel is that you're using um I, I, I just, it seems to me like w w one situation is more like the car and the airplane and that it, it's been demonstrated that it works. All it takes is for everyone to get off their butts and make this happen. The other is a, the promise that we've heard time and time again of, no, 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 we really think we've almost got this. I, I been, but uh, playing devil's advocate, we could compare that to because we could say that a really, you know, if we... You know, there's a Moore's law we could apply to fusion and say that we keep getting this much more efficient. And there is a point somewhere between 2040 or 2050 where they do output more energy than you put into them and they become sustainable. You know, with AI, you know, we, we AI has also been accused that those the two biggest arguments against, you know, trying to break the future are, in fact, AI and fusion and saying that we always thought we were just around the corner on AI. Um, you know, but where you're changing, you know, if you're saying for you with cars, well, uh, uh, you know, that, you know, there's, there's a certain thing that satisfies you and Brian Brushwood and what you're okay with. Uh, and that's, it's going to be different, different people. You know, um, I wrote, there's, there's a New York times article about well, this. And you're, you, by the way, you're a hundred percent right when it comes to legislators, because it's like, there's, there's, you know, we've already had cases where the consumers have said, we're okay with this, give it to us as is. And legislators or, or administrators or bureaucrats have said, no, not safe enough for reasons X, Y, or Z. There's a there's a touching New York Times article about a woman describing how her son, who has a is on the autistic spectrum, loves talking to Siri. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it goes in how, you know, he's a kid that focuses on these these sort of questions that would drive anybody else mad about all about turtles, all about turtles and all these these things. Wants to know the weather in Oklahoma and all this. Siri's happy to tell him this all the time. And, and you know, he, you know, asks Siri if she'll marry him. You know, he he's he's very he knows Siri's not real in a sense but he has that and you sort of think it's good enough for him yeah and as these things get better well and, and it's he, it's patient enough for him and it and it brings him the, the 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 joy that he wishes you know the infinite patient and the infinite knowledge that he wishes that that all humans had so i think that you know i certainly think that we're going to you know for you there's going to be and you know ha, you know your driving situation and mine are very different too you know, and, and that I think that, you know, that I think the threshold for you and where it's practical for you is going to happen much more soon than it'll happen for me in trying to get from Burbank to downtown Hollywood. Yes, I would definitely. And that's actually a really good point, especially, um, you know, if you can remember what it was like back in Florida uh, before you went all Hollywood on us, Andrew, uh, you know, it's like in Texas, it very much is like there's so much stupid highway and it's just there's no reason for for for, you know, somebody to be paying full attention from point A to point B. And it's like as soon as cars can take over, I'll be happier. Yeah, cars take over. Take, mm -hmm. Everyone take over everything. I don't want to do a damn thing. So in the fusion thing, I'm going to say that a it is. Helion Energy, uh, revenue-based startup, 
Um, it's been backed by uh, Y Combinator and Mithril Capital Management. I love Mithril Palantir. I love these companies named for Lord of the Rings uh, <laughs> stuff. Um, let me take a look to see who are the people investing in this. And again, there I've been aware of like Crackpot Energy Investment for years. Okay, but Mithril, of course, want to know why it has a name based on Lord of the Rings because one of its head investors is Peter Thiel. Of course, under <laughs> Palantir. So you've got. Very, very rational people. These are people not prone towards, you know, throwing tons of money at things that are just absolutely ridiculously stupid. These are people who put things behind things like Facebook and Uber and et cetera, who have now put money into Helion Energy, into a fusion company. And it can be a long shot, but, you know, where the money goes is interesting to me. You know, where, where really smart people put their money is always fascinating to me because, you know, smart people can be part of their money, but smart people who are very good at picking these winners – is telling so yeah hey man uh should we do picks let's do picks what do you got justin oh you can't just start picks and then throw to me okay i haven't even thought about it i'll, go, I'll go i'll go first I, I actually have been thinking about this um i guess i got two picks uh first of all been enjoying uh getting caught up on the legend of Korra, uh which uh I believe uh, season three, they released digital online or whatever. Um, uh, season three is much better than season two. So good. About halfway through it. Really excited about it. Uh, but my real pick, which is, uh, as you guys know, I've been a, a wee bit busy of late. And it's been a while since I've had uh, an entire day off to just sit and play video games. And uh, I finally did yesterday. And I spent the entire time continuing to play through Far Cry 3, which is not only a satisfying first-person shooter game, uh, but also uh, has an amazing kind of uh, uh, mythology. This, uh, this, the, you, you, you start off as 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 a a douchebag with with um, uh, I, 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 how can I describe this? Uh, you and your brothers and your girlfriends doing your spring break thing. You look like a frat bro or whatever. And you get kidnapped by some bad guys and you bust out of the island and in your quest to free all of your friends who, again, are, you know, burnout losers and, and, and people absorbed with the idea of becoming a model in Hollywood or whatever. You, you end up on this path to, uh, you know, the warrior's quest. You, you, you end up having you start with nothing running around killing hogs with a knife. So that you can craft a, a a a you know a bandolier or whatever to hold more ammo, and you keep building up, and you eventually build this legend as somebody who's liberating this island. By the way, Far Cry Three came out like a year and a half ago, um, and it is astonishingly satisfying. This mix between not only first person shooter traditional elements, but also like there's a tactical element that makes it worth. Um, uh, uh, scoping out a an encampment before you attack it, and 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 building a strategy of of misdirection and 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 a campaign where you're like, well, I'm going to lead them down this, and then I'm going to plant these mines, and they're going to run over the mines, and then I'll be able to run in, take them out from this side. Um, it's it's really well balanced, really well thought out. The mythology is really interesting to go through, and and uh. Now I'm I'm really entranced by the idea of uh, Far Cry Three Blood Dragon, which I think I'm just going to go straight into afterwards, which is a 1980s post-apocalyptic vision of the future of 2007, where you uh, as Rex Power uh, Colt uh, Colt I think Rex Power Colt is your That's name. That's my porn name. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Have to have to take down somebody who wants to enslave. Uh, the remainder of humanity that lasts after Vietnam II, uh, uh, the War of Vietnam II. Uh, it, anyway, uh, very much enjoying all of this stuff. I, I highly recommend it. I have two picks. First pick, Gone Girl. Oh my gosh, the movie? Yes. You're talking about the uh, the based on the book that was slightly behind the Diamond Club and the iTunes bestsellers for, for like a week <laughs> for a week. <laughs> yes, and I and I do have the the book. I bought the book too because I really enjoyed it. I love Gone Girl. Really, really enjoyed it. It it, it was a uh, uh, I don't want to do any sort of spoilers or anything like that, but I would say that it, it was one of these. Mo I like movies where when you catch up with it, it's already going in a different direction. 
And then you sit back and you look at it at the end of it and you go, man, there's a whole other theme here that's really interesting to me. So I enjoyed Gone Girl. And then uh, I've watched two and a half episodes in, I think, of uh, Gotham. And I'm and? kind of digging Gotham. Well, I, okay. So, so a number of people have told me that Gotham is exceptional. And then like one person says, eh. And of course, I listened to the one person and I, and I haven't tried it yet. Yeah, I, I first one I liked, I, I, I was watching, like, if you have the Apple TV or if you have uh, any app that, like, I think, uh, I, I think RogQ has it too, and that, uh, Google has it, is the, the Fox Now app. So it's Gotham's on Fox. So you can actually watch it for free there, whatever you want. Just the first two episodes had minimal commercials. Then the third episode just gets into, like, it's like 15 or 20 minutes worth of commercials. It's like 20 minutes worth of commercials there, yeah. which just drove me nuts. And so I'm like, well, you know, maybe I'll come back and buy it on iTunes or whatever, or I'll just see if I really want to watch it later on. Um, I, uh, you know, in, in my comparisons to things like, you know, I watched Flash, the first episode of Flash. And I'm like, you know, if I was 12 years old, I would be all over this. This is this is really fun. It's a fun, fun kid show. Um, so I had no problems with Flash, what that is. I'll watch a couple episodes of that to see what that is. But I thought Gotham, I said, you know, what they're trying to do is kind of cool. Um and there's really any other show on television based on a comic book property anybody recommends to me. I think you're, I think you're, you know, a glue sniffer. <laughs> you think there's nothing but, I mean, else this, on TV? Uh, it, it's 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 Bruno Heller, the mastermind of of uh, Rome uh, from HBO, which I know that awesome. that yeah. uh, Andrew and I really much, very much enjoyed. He also did The Mentalist, I believe. But Rome, I think, would be the more accurate uh, comparison in that. It's operating by telling original stories interwoven throughout established mythology. You know, in, in Rome, it was historical events as these kind of two everyman sort of characters find themselves in the middle of big power and intrigue. And in Gotham, it's uh, commi- or ne- Detective Gordon uh, dealing with a, a pre Batman uh, Gotham. I mean, Andrew, I think the one uh, a criticism that I have that I've heard, and, and I think it is something that is kind of overcome overcome a bull is the uh, incessant parade of like, hey, mister, you act like a penguin. Isn't that weird? And he's just like, what? And then just well, walks and, off stage in, left. In defense of that, uh, and, and spoiler alert, they're setting him up to be, you know, a character pre-Batman. Very, very much there gotcha. were the roots of... People who will later on become his foes, they're setting him up to become a kingpin in Gotham. Gotcha. So it's not a, yeah, 20 years from now, this will make a difference. It's like, no, he's, he is a very, haven't watched all the third, you know, like halfway through it up. No, he's like, Cobblepot is active. Cobblepot is very, very, very active. It's not just an aside, like, oh, isn't that? And it's hard to know from the first episode if it's just, no, but he's like, he is, he is the, you know, uh, trying to look for a Roman analogy. It's not a, a wink later on that'll pay off. No, it's like, no, this is real. He's, 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 well, I've, I've seen, and keep in mind, I haven't watched the show, but I've like, I've seen, um, you know, uh, uh, I've seen people tweet things as bombastic as Oswald Cobblepot is every bit as interesting and fascinating a character as Bruce Wayne, you know, like, uh, like uh, it sounds like they're, they're, they're treating. And I, you know, again, I don't know where stuff heads or whatever, but it certainly sounds like they're laying the foundation. Like, um, what if we could tell the story of the villains with the detail and richness that we tell the heroes? Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, absolutely. I mean, and so it, it's there are some things that, you know, are, you know, there are other people, you know, like, oh, they're going to be somebody interesting now, right now. And and then it's kind of like there. But with him, he's, you know, he's he's shaping up to be the, the baddie. Yeah, I got to get on it. I feel like I need I have like a, a week where I don't fly until like Thursday. So I think it's, it's going to be time to, to catch up on, on, uh, on some stuff in Gotham. I know if I don't get into it now, then it'll just be like too far gone. And, and I'll, I, I'll uh, t- like to the, the comparisons. Like I have a friend who's, who's watches all this stuff. And I mentioned Gotham He's like, Oh, I hate Gotham. And he's like, by the way, agents of shields gotten really good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you think it's like a Coke versus Pepsi thing where it's like, he has to pick its side. I don't, he's a DC guy, which is funny. So I, I'm like, I don't think, I think it's just style. I think it's just that it's like, if you can watch a show like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. where Hydra puts their effing logo everywhere they can, <laughs> if they're a secret terrorist organization, and, and you watch an episode where, you know, agents sneak into another S.H.I.E.L.D. base and murder S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. That, well, Jeez. later on we find out that it's like, it. I can't, this show is just, 
not for well, me. And, and, and tonally, it's supposed to, it, it feels like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. feels more along the lines of what Arrow or Flash uh, are, and, and Gotham seems at least to be going more for uh, what something like Rome was. You know, it is, it is more about these characters that are intersecting inside this mythology as opposed to the bang, pow, look at these sexy people kiss each other. Mm. Oh, I'll t- oh, another, what, another, I'm going to throw out another thing. Uh, what I've enjoyed, Star Wars Rebels. Wait, is that out already? Dude, it's out. If you have the Disney XD app, you've got three episodes waiting for you right now. All right, now. hold on. I'm going to jump in. I'm going to see if I can get my girls into that. And again, Star Wars Rebels is is meant for 10-year-olds. It, yeah. You have to understand that. It is, but it is it takes show for place, 10-year-olds. You know, all, all it matters to me is it doesn't take place in prequels world. <laughs> it takes place well, it's, it's, in the it's only right Star real. Wars. Yes, yes, exactly. So, and it's it's there's three episodes in. There's not been one discussion about intergalactic banking. No Jedi councils. Uh, none of the stuff that just drove me nuts about like you know like Clone Wars drove me nuts because it was like, well, we want to put some stuff to give kids understand how the world works, what's really going on by people who don't know how the world works. <laughs> you know, right? Um, I I've been Rebels is fun. These self-contained episodes. The, the way it looks like it, I've just yeah I've just been enjoying it and. It is takes place in you know it's a post Clone Wars world. It doesn't pretend it doesn't exist. There are characters that pop up from there, but it's you know it's a ragtag group of people going out there having adventures. By the way, understand that Star Wars Rebels there has been a gigantic barrier for which this is the first crack and uh, spray of water of original Star Wars material that is that dam is rapidly shattering and about to completely erode as we are enveloped by brand new Star Wars storytelling, which is just amazing. Man. Uh, All right, I got my pick. Uh, I believe that this uh, is the finest original release uh, that Netflix has ever had and it is bojack horseman oh wow uh that's not where i thought you were gonna head with this let's 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 talk bojack um so here is uh i i believe and i i've loved everything that netflix has has come out with uh i think game of uh house of cards uh demonstrated that they can play with the big boys when it comes to orange is uh, the new black big, dark adult sunday night uh you know type kind of fair uh uh orange is the new black was uh exceptionally uh well done uh for what it is but ultimately kind of in the second season sort of revealed itself to have the same sort of limitations as the genji kohan show like weeds did uh hemlock grove uh you had i mean arrested development was which was uh very very fun but ultimately very flawed this is uh, a cartoon that is obviously extraordinarily silly uh, in its premise and its setup, and its characters are very funny. But what Netflix offers is an ability to do a story that isn't just what you would see on Cartoon Network. It, it, it felt, you know, it's not just a bunch of sophomoric poop and wiener jokes, although there are a plenty of them. It gets into a very kind of dark... Uh, mature, almost bipolar kind of tone wherein you have one episode that is incredibly depressing and is this like very, uh, if this were a more serious show, would be a a contemplative take on, uh, you know, almost a darker entourage kind of story. And the next episode is about as silly as possible. Just to, I mean, very minor spoilers. Uh, after this, the most serious episode, the first scene in the next episode introduces a new character w- uh, who are basically just uh, three children uh, <laughs> sitting on each other's shoulders, little rascal style, uh, wearing an overcoat, which people confuse to be an actual human. Like, it, it, is, it is great. I, I, I very much enjoyed it. Uh, I thought the voice talent was amazing. And it is the greatest achievement of Keith Olbermann's career. Uh, okay, well, and you're just saying that because he plays a whale who does the news. <laughs> the no, humpback because whale. in the second episode, 
he get he goes full Olbermann, and just to understand that he knows and can summon the full Olbermann, like you, sir, should be ashamed, uh, as a whale that says the phrase, uh, "There is nothing silly about Neil McBeal, the Navy SEAL," and then blows uh, water out of his blowhole. Is uh, his blowhard? The yeah, there, there's the uh, there's the three kids as a, as a, as a grown up. Um, so so let me ask you this real quick because I found the show extremely hot and cold early on. Like I was like. Like, very funny, not funny at all. Very funny, not funny at all. Um, and it wasn't until, like, uh, maybe maybe it deserves a second watch through again. Because uh, watching it uh, as you get through, you know, when you get to episodes, you know, six through ten or whatever, uh, you start to realize, like, oh, wait, they are not telling single individual episodes where everything wraps up. And, and the point of these were was not to make you chuckle. The point was to tell a character arc uh, of, of a transformation of our main character. And you also see transformations of smaller characters. And in that context, I could understand why they would leave things that definitely fell short of the mark on the funny spectrum early on. And that felt like failed jokes, but instead it's like, well, you can't lose that because you need to set up that this character cares about this so that you understand why he does this later and why it, it results in this transformation later on. Like, like, did you, did you have any of that? Or it sounds like you just loved it since page one because it took me a good, like it was good enough to get me f through the first six episodes. And it wasn't until like halfway through that I was like, Oh no, wait, this is really great. And it's also not the show I thought it was. Well, I, I, there's, I, I think as I've gotten older, I've, I've found myself less needing to see, um, let, let's say, I mean, South park is brilliant. Right. And, and I love South park and, and there's no way that you can, not look at their body of work and say that it is clear genius that is writing this. And yet I don't watch South Park every week. You know, I, I just kind of wait until it piles up and then eventually I binge through it. Same right. thing with some of the Cartoon Network uh, cartoons when it's kind of just straight or even Archer, which I very much love. Uh, when it's just kind of straight comedy writing, I, I tend to not be as invested as so many of my other shows are very that I follow religiously are extraordinarily character driven. So the first couple episodes, I think, are probably not nearly as funny as as an Archer or a Venture Brothers or something like that. Not not nearly um, as I mean there, there's brief moments where I cackle laughter and then other moments where I was like, ooh, how did that one make it through the process? I, I, I guess I didn't have but then again I'm not so I'm not so dialed in to to that rhythm and pacing of those other shows that I don't think that I, I necessarily judged it against that. I found the high notes for me rang high enough. Uh like, I mean, the second episode is where they have the Keith Olbermann thing, and I was just dying because you, Keith Olbermann is just sold such a funny figure like, to me Worth in the general. price of admission no matter what, yeah. Uh, but then, you know, kind of it was enough for me to just sort of get hooked and just realize, like, wow, they're doing something a lot different. What I also found to be remarkable is that take a look at something like Archer. You have a, a, a history in the last 15 years or 20 or, uh, or 10 years of cartoons having very anti-hero central characters. Like as cartoons, as it became okay for cartoons to be for adults, it, it became more and more fashionable of like, okay, well let's wrap our show around a reprehensible human. And you usually need some element to keep you focused on it. Like Archer's an asshole, but he's a great spy. Right. And he just kind of demonstrates himself to be a great spy uh, you know, uh, over and over and over again. And so that's why you continue to pay attention to him. And any incremental human sort of moments he has is just kind of ancillary. What was remarkable about BoJack Horseman is that there really, I mean, there is a human process and, and you know, it's funny because he's a horse, but like there is, there is a, he reacts to things in a realistic way. And yet it's not exactly like you you never really have more than just you sort of feel bad and are kind of repulsed by him uh, throughout it. There, there's no other redeeming quality except for just exceptional storytelling. I mean, I guess that's the thing, right? Like, here is a popular character who enjoyed success and yet is deeply flawed and and not at peace with his own success. And and as you find out over the course of the story, you know, how he got there and, and the the sacrifices he made, you know, the, the the decisions to end friendships in order to protect his career or whatever, it 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 it, it is a a painfully accurate 
uh, depiction of relationships that 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 even the three of us have had in in Hollywood. I mean, it's this 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 shit is Uncanny Valley, right? I mean, it's like it's um. Uh, like, like it's it's an accurate accurate depiction of what it means when people you know have success and make decisions that you are disappointed in. You know, all I'll say is that it's it's less of a cartoon than Entourage, which is Agre- oh, hundred percent, which I will is say, interesting I will say- because it stars a horse and a dog and chickens and penguins. Far and- more accurate, far more believable, far more uh, realistic depiction of Hollywood than Entourage ever will be. But and yet also as as perversely aspirational uh, uh but and but also strangely more human than Entourage as well. Uh and there's other funny little things to it, like the fact that the main character is defined by uh, you know, a, a character who had one or an actor who had one defining role and now finds himself boxed in by it. And his protege, as played by Aaron Paul, uh, they do not shy away from illustrating uh, him as an act. They might as well just call the character Aaron Paul as he plays this caricature of Jesse from Breaking Bad <laughs> Uh, that is now in this in this kind of universe like it's it's very very smart and I very much enjoyed it and uh, I am not a huge cartoon guy and I very much loved this cartoon well there you go it's been uh, weird cartoons <laughs> so sorry I'll, I'll I'll take the fall on that that was me that was, it wouldn't have gone nearly as long if I wasn't so excited cartoons. I mentioned Star Wars Rebels too oh, I that's mean, right I just... you're right. <laughs> Touche, sir. Yeah. Uh, Wait, no, and I, I talked about Legend of Korra. All we did was talk about cartoons for th- for thirty minutes. Because uh, we're dorks. <laughs> yup. All what right, ladies and gentlemen, it's been weird. Yeah. Uh. Let me hear you say, "Ah." Uh. <clears throat> Puerto Rican League champ. Weird things recording. Hey, we've done a few of these Weird Things episodes. Yeah. So do we do we Patreon it so we can get somebody to uh, supervise and... Oh, man, I, I mean, and to be honest, like, I don't even mind... Um, I don't even mind doing it, you know? It's just the one thing that's hard for me is to explain to Bonnie why I'm still doing it. <laughs> like, Bonnie's like, why are you... Uh, uh, the kids and you're doing... Uh, I'm like, well, because we're doing Weird Things. And, like, and it's like, hey, man, we did... Uh, we did NSFW for four years, making nothing, and, you know, it turned into a thing. Maybe this will, too. Um, I was thinking about it the other day, thinking about if we if we did do a Patreon on it, what we'd be able to do as far as, you know, having, you know, a little more adult supervision on putting the things together and doing that, and, and maybe, you know, more putting links up and stuff onto the blog and we'll, stuff. We'll post- I think it's, it's got to be a plus version of this. Well, exactly, yeah. and also adding a video version of it, because right now we do video for the live viewers, but nobody um, on there does that. Uh, hey, what do we want to call this episode, by the way? Um... um Highway to the danger zone. Um, oh, highway to the robot zone? Uh, to the fusion zone. Fusion zone, there you go. So, superficially, I like the look of Yosemite. <clears throat> yeah, I got to uh, I gotta update. By the way, I very much love... I, I've just kind of got like a full frontal... Uh, experience on uh, iMovie, the the that that came with uh, Mavericks, the the Tell update us about this full frontal you put on iMovie. <laughs> it was amazing, uh, uh, really slick. I love the new interface that they have. I found it a lot easier to manage, um, and it has the awesome feature of exporting your videos in the background. So you could, I had to edit a bunch of things r- one right after another kind of on a time budget and uh, you didn't have to wait to export like the the uh, program continued to, to render let you edit the other stuff while it was pushing it out so wow huge fan <laughs> first time long time i movie uh all right let me do this i'm going to post the thing and the thing and then we're going to be set for live we'll never have to do another episode again Bite your tongue. 
Is it time to panic <laughs> about Ebola? Hey, man, we didn't even mention Ebola. I'm so proud of us. Yeah. We mentioned it last week. Yeah, we did. Uh, by the way, Bonnie still panicked over Ebola. Well, that's good. I mean, she like, at the very least, like, it is only three hours away from you. You know, like the city most... Uh, my, most favorite, my favorite headline of this morning was... Uh, the cruise line that contains an Ebola worker returned to port in Dallas today. Wait, what was that? The headline said, uh, uh, the cruise line containing one worker exposed to Ebola returned to port in his hometown of Dallas today. Dallas. Oh, that's cool. Dallas is five hours. From oh, the coast. In, oh, the home port of Dallas. Is, yes. Oh, okay. It says a return to gotcha. Dallas. This is jur uh, journalism in action. Is our geography knowledge in action here? Oh yeah, I guess so. I guess yeah. that's that's why that got through. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm loving like the uh, like the Disney XD app on the Apple TV is pretty cool. Um, uh -huh. You know, some of that stuff. It's cool. Do you think? Uh, how do you? Uh, uh, real quick before we sign off. Maybe this is like a precursor for Cord Killers tomorrow, but what do you guys think uh, HBO's play is going to be for a standalone service? How much do you think they're going to charge? I think it's going to be so expensive that people are going to go, F you, I'll keep my cable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think no matter what it is, right now you can buy cable from your provider and, and authentication for HBO. It's called Internet Plus on, on Comcast. Like, it is a thing that you can do, and I will suspect that whatever HBO charges, Comcast will make that very compelling and competitive. Yeah. Uh, that, that's why I, I think it'll be 30 bucks, and I think Comcast will drop, like, what is it, 50 bucks or 49, 48 or some crap for the similar service? Uh, I feel like like what they're really doing is making an offering, because right now... They are uh, intentionally, almost statedly intentionally creating a black market for their stuff. They proudly, you know, strut around talking about being the most pirated show uh, and, and so on. And the reason is, is because they don't sell Game of Thrones afterwards. There's no legal way to get it. So, of course, it becomes the number one most pirated show. Uh, this is, I, I would imagine 30 bucks is enough that they're like, oh, shit. Well, I guess we'll hold on yeah, to that. I don't know if it's high as that or not, but I know that, like, you know, like you looked at like CBS came out and they're they're selling it for like eight bucks or something like that, which it's like, all right, let me get this straight. Eight bucks for CBS to still get all the commercials. Yeah. You know, and, and theoretically, like every every cable system, generally most every cable system is supposed to have like a super secret, like basic package that's like 20 bucks or 30 bucks a month or something like that. That's, you know, like the poor people package. Like they did that like in Broward County. You know, in order to get, in order to get, you know, because it's a monopoly, in order to get that, the state, you know, the city can say or the county can say, okay, but you have to offer this. And they did it. And then uh, somebody did like, a, a, did a study to find, did, you know, asked to find out how many people actually had it in the entire county. And only two people had them. One of them was the county commissioner. Wow. Yeah. Because yeah, they were the only ones that knew, you know, about this. Wow. Yeah. I, I was actually thinking about doing a thing for, for Daily Tech News Show where I, I just kind of illustrated, you know, like, as much as these are very interesting and important announcements, um, you know, I don't know how much they are actually going to impact things beyond like what happened with AT and T and Google for you, Brian. Like, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, ha -ha, oh, look, turns out we can make this three hundred gigabits down and fifty up. Whoops. Yeah. The internet fairy came by and made it 900 down and 300 up. And it's like that, that, that I think is just, it's going to scare them into doing things like selling you HBO, uh, you know, with your internet and pro and, and possibly hopefully selling just, just authentication packages where you can just get a Comcast login that, you know, uh, will get you to all these other sites that require them and streaming services that require them. Like, uh, ESPN and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, and and this, think this is why, uh, uh, I, I don't know if you were on any of the episodes where I said it, but it's like, you know, I keep projecting the, the formation sometime in the next two years of the fig leaf, uh, you know, fake cable network where it's like, they don't actually deliver anything over any cable pipe. All they do is declare themselves a cable network, 
uh, pay whatever fees it takes and then sell you uh, passwords so that you can get in yeah. and get authenticated on all these things. The, the problem is, is the legality is how all that's based. The licenses are based on zip codes. Um, so you would but, have to be physically within. Uh, oh, you have to have a physical presence within X, Y, or Z? Yeah, because I mean, like, because right now, like, Time Warner would love to sell internet cable to somebody who's in a Comcast area or something. Right. But um, that would be cool, though. And I think they're going to have to change, you know. Well, and I think stuff like this does it, you know, because HBO launching their own streaming service leads to HBO making it more compelling, and HBO making it more compelling leads to them saying, well, well, you know, what did we make in there? What can we make if we are a very aggressive uh, uh, package that, uh, you know, like entices people to do it? I, I think it's kind of a non-starter if it's anywhere more than four or five dollars more than than an average Netflix subscription, though. Like, I feel like, you know, the, the market kind of punished Netflix for HBO stepping into the space or the announcement that they will be stepping into the space. Uh, and I think that unless they are a true competitor to Netflix uh, price wise, then I don't know. Uh, I don't know how they are going to do. I don't know, man, if if they offer the ease of subscription, because I only subscribe to or when I was, you know, I, I would take on HBO and then I would get rid of it. Uh, and it would always be for Game of Thrones season. If I could get out of uh, Game of Thrones only having spent 90 bucks for that duration of being in the HBO ecosystem and it was not a you're signing up for a long term and it will be a big 45 minute call to cancel or whatever, but instead just a little online transaction button. I, I think I would pay 30 bucks for, for a couple, you oh, know, I, I think month, there will be months. usage of it, but yeah. I don't think it'll be Netflix usage. And, and no, I, don't, I, I, I agree. But, but also I don't, I don't think HBO wants Netflix usage. I mean, I think they're, they're in, in this, you know, war, I think HBO is, is old media and they just want to hold on to their spot, but also, you know, quit people from like, you know, they got what they wanted out of the notoriety of being the most pirated, whatever. And now they want to dial that down. And, uh, Oh, I think, you know, if, have a way to close it off. This is not them bolstering. Like if 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 they they could very easily be the jump up and down poster child of the cable authentication universe, right? They're not doing that. Right. They're deciding to go their own way. Right. So if they are looking at a world where they do not want to be caught unprepared for cable companies not to be their prime moneymaker, then you better believe they want and need Netflix usage. Like well, they, they, they need to be a very heavily subscribed platform to continue to operate at the levels that they are operating now. But the problem is, is they can't make that move now without seriously pissing off all of their existing cable affiliates, right? Oh, yeah. But, so, but, so, which, which explains to you what a move it is to even do this. Well, uh, and again, like this is what tells me that they're going to price it too high to actually attract any viewers. They're going to they're going to price it at a level where they get to say that they did it. Hear that fans of HBO. We did the thing that you wanted. Also, cable companies notice nobody's subscribing because we priced it so high. Everything's cool. Like that's that seems to me there to be the play that they should do. Possibly. We'll see. Yeah, I think that the cable companies will be very competitive on it. I, I, that's what I do. I do, I do believe in that. Yeah, I all, agree. I, all I know is like, it's like I have my house in Florida. Like, I keep an internet connection there because I have a drop cam there, and like for my comp for my HBO, and I pay like 110 bucks a month. But I'm supposed to have a built-in plan for because I live in a community and they pay into it. But trying to switch out over to like you know Internet Plus or whatever, you know, they're gonna tell me it's not available or whatever. It's like it's 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 utterly, utterly, utterly absurd, you know, and it's like. It's how do you create a cord cutter, you know? Yeah. Agreed. All right. Well, I guess I'm going to shut down the feed. That was a good, uh, that was a good weird things, gentlemen. Yeah.